All right. I'd like to read just one verse to introduce this D.L. Moody series, part two. And it's from Second Chronicles, and it is in chapter 16 and verse 9. And it's been addressed particularly to King Asa uh, after a failure on his part. But uh, what we read here is very interesting. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And the idea is this, the Lord is looking for someone <laughs> that he can use, looking for somebody who's in a right condition that God can use him. And we know that D.L. Moody was such a man. He was greatly used of God in seeing revival on both sides of the Atlantic and being used of God to win many, many thousands of souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we were trying to do was investigate what were the characteristics that stood out in the life of D.L. Moody so that we might somehow maybe align our lives up to his life and say, well, maybe if God could use him, he could use us if we kind of get in line with these characteristics. And we mentioned seven of them. I'm going to go through them again, just give the list. And we managed to cover three last time. First thing, and of course, this is coming from R.A. Torrey, who was very close to D.L. Moody, who had written this booklet on the reasons why God used D.L. Moody. And he said this, first of all, number one, that D.L. Moody was a fully surrendered man. He had fully surrendered all his life, all his ambitions, all his claims at the feet of the Lord Jesus to do with whatever the Lord wanted to do with him, a fully surrendered man. And then secondly, we said that he was a man of prayer. And uh, one of the things that Tori said was somewhat surprising, but he it really sh it stood out to me that Tori said that Moody was actually a better prayer than he was a preacher. And Moody was a wonderful preacher. But as far as Tori was concerned, he was a man who knew how to lay hold on God in prayer, did D.L. Moody. And that stood out to him. And then thirdly, he was a deep and practical student of the Bible. And that's about as far as we got last time. I'll give you four, five, six, and seven. We won't get through all of them, but th these are the other characteristics. Number four, humble man. You want to think about that this evening. A man free from the love of money. And then number six, his consuming passion for the salvation of the lost. And number seven, he was endued with power from on high. So I want to just think about his humility for a moment. And of course, we, we know in scripture uh, that God, well, God resists the proud. Uh, he's actively sets himself in opposition against the pride for person, but it, he, he resists the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. And uh, I just want to read a verse from 1 Peter uh, chapter uh, 5 <clears throat> that would highlight just the importance of this characteristic of humility. And then we'll think about how that was seen in the life of D.L. Moody. And so 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, it just simply says this. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, this is what Dale uh, Moody, what was said of him by, by R.A. Torrey. Torrey said this, I think D.L. Moody was the humblest man I ever knew in all my life. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And he says, he loved to quote the words of another. And this is the quote, faith gets the most, love works the most, but humility keeps the most. I thought that was interesting. That's one you have to think about, ponder. But I'll say it again. Faith gets the most, love works the most, but humility keeps the most. He says he was the most humble man when you bear in mind the great things that he did and the praise that was lavished upon him. You see, sometimes... It's harder for a man to cope with praise than it is to cope with criticism. And he had a lot of praise lavished upon him for his usefulness for God. 
And yet he handled it amazingly, making sure that God and God alone got all the glory from his life. In fact, often he would have conferences at Northfield in his later years, and he would bring in Bible teachers, men like uh, G. Campbell Morgan, C.I. Schofield, other well-known men, and he would sit in the front row listening to these men like a child, just enjoying their ministry. But he would never, ever include himself in the itinerary of speakers at the Northfield conferences. And yet everybody was there because they wanted to hear D.L. Moody. And they literally had to, including the other preachers, beg him to take the pulpit. But he had no desire of putting himself forward. And so God used him in a marvelous way because, as R.A. Torrey said, D.L. Moody had never heard of himself. He was not filled with his own sense of self-importance. And that's a challenge, isn't it? To have that childlike humility that marked this man and made him so usable. In his heart of hearts, he constantly underestimated himself and overestimated others. He was constantly aware that he felt inadequate and uh, often felt inadequate because of his lack of education, uh, always felt intimidated, and yet God used him remarkably despite all of these things. Now, R. A. Torrey gives a great warning. He, he says here, how many a man has been full of promise and God has used him, and then the man thought that he was the whole thing and God was compelled to set him aside. I believe more promising workers have gone on the rocks through self-sufficiency and self-esteem than through any other cause. And we can see that in Israel's history, can't we? Kings, that uh, the Lord helped them, and when they were strong, uh, what happened? Pride kicked in, and God had to set them aside. Well, that's true amongst the servants of God. He would get down on his face before God, knowing he was human, and ask God to empty him of all self-sufficiency. And God was faithful to answer his prayer. Why, how good it would be if we could be gone and done with all self-sufficiency. The entire shore of the history of Christian workers is strewn with the wrecks of gallant vessels that were full of promise a few years ago. But these men became puffed up and were driven on the rocks by the wild winds of their own raging self-esteem. And the warning to all of us, if we are ever going to be instruments in God's hands, we must always give God the glory for anything that is accomplished through our lives. He will not share his glory with anyone. And so how could God use D.L. Moody? Because of his great humility. And that's a challenge to every one of us. And then he was a man free from the love of money. Now, it is interesting that tonight Bob chose to sing that song, The Ninety and the Nine. Actually, it was in a newspaper that uh, they were on a train. I believe they were going up to maybe Edinburgh. And on the train journey, um, Mr. Sankey saw that poem, thought it would make an interesting song, cut it out and took it with him. And then uh, Moody preached on uh, the Lord, uh, the good shepherd going after the sheep that went astray. And he asked if, if Sankey had a song. And he basically stood up and sung that poem and made the tune up as he went. And so that's that's the story behind it. But God blessed that and all of these, what they called the Sankey hymn book. And so initially they wanted to get it published because everybody wanted, the, these were new, especially in Scotland where they only sang the Psalms and Moody songs uh, or, the, or the Sankey songs were were all new to them, but everybody was singing them. They uh, People had gone to the Crusades night after night, and everybody was singing them, and they wanted to get their hands on copies of these songs. And so uh, they went to publishers. Nobody would do it. So Moody personally paid out of his own funds for the first edition of the Sankey hymn book. And, of course, it began to take off. And as a result of it, 
millions uh, uh, well of dollars in today's terms uh, he it says mr moody might have been a wealthy man money had no charms for him he loved to gather money for god's work but he refused to accumulate money for himself he told me this is uh, again the words of tory that during the world's fair that if he had taken for himself the royalties of the hymn books which he had published they would be amounted to at that time. So this is in the 1800s, a million dollars. So you can imagine what that would be in our time. But Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey, by the way, to his credit, refused to touch the money. He had a perfect right to take it. He was responsible for the publication of the books, the initial outlay. It was his money that went into the publication of the first of them. And they, it's true to say that, that millions of dollars in his lifetime passed through the hands of Mr. Moody, but they did not stick to his fingers. Now, what's interesting about D.L. Moody, and you read it, and we uh, would probably find a little bit embarrassed by this, he had no problem asking for money. You know, we often think of the faith principle and we, we won't talk to anybody but the Lord alone uh, for financial needs. But Mr. Moody had no difficulty. And part of the reason was this was a day and age where millionaires were made overnight. This was the day of new money. This was the day of the accumulation of tremendous wealth. And so what Mr. Moody did was he would go to these men and say, look, I have a great opportunity for you to do some good with your newfound wealth. And so he would use these funds, never for his own benefits. He would use them for the YMCA movement, which was booming at that time. So they're building a lot of new YMCAs. He would he would get this money for those purposes. And then the church in Chicago, he would get them to, you know, write checks for a couple of thousand dollars to to help build the uh, the church in Chicago, the building there, the schools at Northfield, lastly at Moody Bible Institute, and so. Uh, one particular man, Cyrus H. McCormack, he had made millions um, with farming implements. And Moody certainly knew how to wrap Mr. McCormack around his little finger. And every time he needed extra funds for something, he would go and see Mr. McCormack and Mr. McCormack would write him a check. And oftentimes Mr. McCormack would be so convicted of the value of putting his money into Moody's hands because he knew that it would be used in a tremendous way in society. And so he'd be going to write a check for $1,000 and instead he'd write one for 2000 <laughs> And that was just, just Moody was able to get these men to see that God had blessed them with this incredible fortune and there's nothing better they could do with their funds than to invest in eternal projects where many souls would be one for the Savior. And so, and yet in the midst of all of this money that passed through his fingers, none of it stuck to his own hands. He was a man of absolute financial integrity, uh, lived uh, in a sense relatively um, on, a, on a small amount of money so that everything could go into the work of the Lord. So he was a real uh, challenge in terms of his love of uh, his lack of love of money and of course we're told in scripture aren't we that love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and again we're also reminded that there's many an evangelical preacher who has been ruined not only by pride but by greed and so many of our tv preachers today in their private jets and their fleet of bentleys or rolls royces and all this kind of stuff uh, leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. Nobody could ever say that of D.L. Moody. And so he was a man who was entirely free from the love of money. And again, what a challenge to all of us. And then number six, his consuming passion for the salvation of the lost. And this is going to take a bit of our time. Mr. Moody made the resolution shortly after he himself was saved that he would never let 24 hours pass over his head without speaking to at least one person about his soul. 
he would often re realize toward the end of the day he had not spoken to someone about their soul. And and he may be in his PJs in bed. And he realized, I've not done it. So he'd get up, get dressed, and go out into the night, even if it was raining, to try and find some soul to speak about the Savior because he was serious about keeping his commitment to share the gospel with someone. So on one particular occasion, he stepped up to a stranger, and he said to him, this was his usual approach, are you a Christian? It was kind of a, a day and age where everybody thought they were Christians, but they really weren't. It's like our day when everybody thinks they're atheists, but they're really not. It was kind of the default position. So the default position was they were Christians. So he said, are you a Christian? And the man replied very curtly, that is none of your business, whether I'm a Christian or not. If you are not a sort of preacher, I would knock you into the gutter for your impertinence. Mr. Moody said a few earnest words and passed on. The man found out it was Moody, and he went to one of Moody's influential financial backers and complained, saying that this man Moody had zeal without knowledge. In fact, so much so that he gained the nickname in those days, Crazy Moody. That's what he was known as in Chicago, Crazy Moody. Now, R.A. Torrey says something very challenging here. He says, let me say in passing, it's far better to have zeal without knowledge than it is to have knowledge without zeal. Some men and women are so full of knowledge like an egg is full of meat. They're so deeply versed in Bible truth that they can sit in criticism on the preachers and give the preachers pointers. But they have so little zeal that they do not lead one soul to Christ in a whole year. So that's a challenge, isn't it? A challenge. I think a challenge of today's evangelicalism is that many of us, and myself included, we're really honest. We have far more knowledge than we have zeal. Shame on us. <laughs> and so, anyway, Moody's friend, when he heard this, he rebuked Moody kind of told Moody, you need to kind of tone things down a little bit. Moody was perplexed because he just felt this is what the Lord would have him do. So he just carried on until the Lord would show him differently. But one late rainy night, an urgent knock came to Moody's door. It was the man who had been previously offended at Moody's question. This is what he said. Mr. Moody, I have not had a good night's sleep since that night you spoke to me under the lamppost. And I have come around at this unearthly hour of the night for you to tell me what I have to do to be saved. Mr. Moody took him in, told him what to do to be saved. He accepted Christ. And when the civil war broke out, he went to the front lines and laid down his life for his country. But he was gloriously saved man. And so that reinvigorated Mr. Moody and his commitment to never let a day go by without talking to some soul about Christ. If we were as full of zeal for the salvation of souls as D.L. Moody was, we might just impact a whole continent with the gospel of Jesus Christ if we had more zeal. Not only was Moody always on the job, he was always getting others to work as well. See, that's what a true evangelist is, right? He doesn't just evangelize. He also teaches others to do the work of an evangelist. And Moody was always getting people to work, getting them out, evangelizing. Here's another great, great story. And there's so many of these stories of Dale Moody's life, but this one is a thrilling one. Uh, again, once he was walking down a certain street in Chicago, Mr. Moody stepped up to a man, a perfect stranger to him, and said, Sir, are you a Christian? You mind your own business, was his reply. Mr. Moody replied, this is my business. The man said, well, then you must be Mr. Moody. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Because he was known that was his business. One time he was going on to Milwaukee on a train, and in the seat that he had chosen, 
A man, a traveling man sat next to him. Mr. Moody sat down beside him, immediately began to talk with him. Where are you going? Mr. Moody asked. When he told the name of the town, he said, well, we'll soon be there. We have to get down to business at once. Are you saved? The man said that he was not. Mr. Moody took out his Bible there on the train, showed him the way of salvation, and he said, now, you must take Christ. The man did, and he was converted right there in the railway carriage. Later co communicated with Moody, became an avid supporter of the work of the evangelist. This story that I want to relate now, which will complete our little talk for this evening, but it's a wonderful story. On one occasion in Chicago, Mr. Moody saw a little girl standing on the street with a pail in her hand, a bucket in her hand. He went up to her and invited her to his Sunday school, telling her what a pleasant place it was. She promised to go the following Sunday, but she did not do so. Mr. Moody watched for her for weeks, and then one day he saw her on the street again. At some distance from him, he started towards her, but she saw him too and started to run away. Mr. Moody followed her. Down she went one street, Mr. Moody after her. Up she went another street, Mr. Moody after her. Through an alley, Mr. Moody still following out on another street, Mr. Moody after her. Then she dashed into a saloon and Mr. Moody dashed in after her. She ran out the back door and up a flight of stairs, Mr. Moody still following. She dashed into a room, Mr. Moody following. She threw herself under the bed and Mr. Moody reached under the bed and pulled her out by the foot and led her to Christ. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you try that today. It probably wouldn't go down too well. But nevertheless, after he had led this girl to Christ, he found that her mother was a widow who had once seen better circumstances, but had gone down until now she was living over this saloon. She had several children. Mr. Moody led the mother and all the family to Christ. Several of the children were prominent members of the Moody Church until they moved away and afterwards became prominent in churches elsewhere. This particular child whom he pulled from underneath the bed was, when I was the pastor of the Moody Church, this is Tori speaking, the wife of one of the most prominent officers in the church. When Mr. Moody pulled that little child out from under the bed by the foot, he was pulling a whole family into the kingdom of God. His love for souls knew no class limitations. He was no respecter of persons. It might be an earl or a duke, or it might be an ignorant colored boy on the street. It was all the same to him. There was a soul to save, and he did what lay in his power to save that soul. And Mr. Moody primarily was greatly used of God because he never, ever lost that passion for reaching lost souls with the gospel till his dying day. And so there's six out of seven. I want to particularly leave the last one about being endued with power from on high till next week, because that is a very, very important topic. And I think it's something we lack so much today that we need to grapple with this question of power from on high. But may the Lord encourage us with what we've heard tonight. May the Lord keep us small in our own eyes. If we don't want to be set aside as useless for God, we better not have too high an opinion of ourselves or take ourselves too seriously. It's not about us. It's about him, the Lord. And then be careful about money. Don't let it stick to our fingers. Ask the Lord to bless us and enable us to be generous for the work of God. And then, Lord, give us that burden for souls like Mr. Moody had. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.